the polystyrene cladding risk. Let's have a look. Good morning everyone, I'm Florian Heiser and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. Today, ready for a new day, stein of coffee in hand, and I thought we'd look at the polystyrene cladding risk. Now I've talked about this in previous episodes where buildings in Victoria have had issue because, you know, they've got potential huge bills, which hopefully will be addressed now, with polystyrene cladding. Now, I thought we'd read through this article, then we'd look at what they're tr why they're using this material, what they're trying to do with it, the intended material, which is poly polyurethane, and the difference. Because honestly, I think it all comes back to the same thing, lack of supervision, lack of the traditional police in the industry, the architects and the certifiers, having the authority and the power to monitor it. Because people are going to design and construct, people aren't paying for contract administration or site inspections, people aren't paying for a clerk of works. So substitutions can happen and this, it's a big issue. So combustible cladding removal will uncover litany of problems, exports warn. Yes, yes it will. It really will. And that's a good thing. It will, dis it will uncover systematic issues in our construction industry. Although we seem to be repeating the same lessons that other countries have learned again and again and again, but it's good that this is being addressed. So this is an article from ABC. So Craig Finch's apartment is so highly flammable that residents were ordered to remove wood chips, wood chip mulch and trees because of fears any fire in the garden could quickly engulf the block. Okay, a fire in your garden could engulf the block. Just, just think about that. And remember, they're, they're having to remove trees. So that's going to have an energy load impact on uh, the buildings. It's extremely dangerous, Mr. Finch said. Large parts of the complex located in Frankston in Melbourne Southeast is wrapped in non-compliant polystyrene painted to look like concrete. Now, here you go. Here's the main issue that we have here. It's non-compliant. It's illegal. It's not allowed on the site. Okay. So what happened? Did the architect spec the wrong material? Did the builder substitute something? Did the subcontractor put it in and not tell anyone? What happened? It's non-compliant. We don't need to make any changes to our legislation, none at all. We already have processes in place that say that this material is non-compliant, shouldn't be used in that purpose. Was it a, a let's say an interpretation by the certifier of, of what the use of it? You know, because it can be a bit vague. There's a whole lot of issues. The highly combustible material is even surrounding the emergency exits for multiple apartments. That is insane. That that is a big. That's a real serious issue. Because if you get get out of a burning building and then you're at the fire door, and you can't get out because there's a fire there. Along the egress pass, the escape pass, you need to meet. There's certain requirements you need to meet, and this is, hasn't been caught. So. There's a lot of things here. I'd love to, if anyone has the documents for Craig's building, could you send them through? I'd love to have a look at them. I'd love to have a look at what was spest. Apparently it goes up like petrol, Mr. Finch said. Well, it's styrofoam. You know, have you ever set styrofoam on fire, chucked it on a bonfire and seen what happened as a kid? Maybe children don't do things like that anymore, but you know, back in the eighties, apparently it goes up like petrol. I read that already. In a case of fire, how would residents get to the street? Well, no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. This is the problem. A lot of our legislation, a lot of the rules and regulations we have that are being ignored came out of people dying. Maybe not here in Australia, maybe overseas, but if you, you know, all these laws that we have, they came to stop people dying. That's the problem. You know, fire escapes, people would lock them to keep their workers in. What happened? Whole factory load of seamstresses died. Laws changed. It's, it's sad in a way that that's how we respond to these things. You know, that's how fast government is. So last year, the Victorian Building Task Force issued an emergency order on the building, initially instructing residents to fix the combustible cladding within seven days. Except that's insane. It was also impossible. It was, sorry, it was an impossible demand and one that infuriated residents who had for years been flagging concerns with the VBA about a range of issues. The builder has since been deregistered. So the builder's gone. So what recourse do they have? There's mushrooms growing in the building. There's leaking windows and doors, Mr. Finch said. 
We're on our third balcony collapse. We're on our third balcony collapse. What? What did I just read? On our third balcony collapse. That's just... Well, that's just uh, the way construction is handled in a modern first world country where we're running out of water. Yes, yeah. Did a video on that yesterday. You should have a look. It's uh, it's scary how how fast our population has grown and how slow our water supply storage has kept up. So, the property is one of 15 buildings to undergo emergency rectification works as part of the Victorian government's plan to fix 500 buildings considered to have the highest risk of fire. But it remains unclear how far rectification work will extend beyond replacing the combustible cladding. Well, think about it. If you have to, re I mean, if you, if, the thing is, by replacing a big portion of it, you're going to cause issues to the rest of the structure. So, if you, if, here's a word of advice for those of you that are getting this done by the government builders, do a defects or dilapidation survey of your entire building first. You know, and get them to sign off on it. Just just in case they cause other damage in their rectification works. To cover yourself. Because if, you know, the, it, the government may be all being nice and good and come and being your friend. But don't trust them, guys. Do not trust them. So we want the place brought up to code, Mr. Finch said. I don't care what that means. They've let us down in such a bad way. If they find stuff under there that needs to be fixed, it needs to be fixed. They just can't patchwork the problem. Yeah, I, I think you're a bit naive there and thinking how the government's going to approach it, but, you know, maybe I'm just more cynical. You know, never seen a compliant building. So the state government has earmarked a budget of $600 million to fix the 500 most dangerous buildings over a five-year period. Each building will be treated on a case-by-case -case basis, meaning the type of work necessary to make the building safe could uh, widely differ depending on the apartment complex. Well, yeah, it could. I'm just thinking just of the traffic management costs with these buildings occupied. The government fund may be used to replace cladding and fix faulty alarm systems, while other defects issues are referred to the VBA. But engineers are concerned removing the cladding will expose a litany of fire safety problems. I've never seen a compliant building, engineered, engineer Jonathan Dullo said. Wherever I look at a building, the problem that people think is there is not the real problem. Oh, ouch. Yeah, that's that's showing you some experience there that, that we probably don't want to hear right now, do we? Mr. Dollar, who works for a fire and forensic engineering firm, Basic Expert, said common problems include faulty fire detection, smoke ventilation and sprinkler systems, wall and plumbing not sealed properly, and unsafe fire exit and elevator systems. I would put aside about $3 billion, he said. <laughs> well, he's probably right. It's going to be the biggest and most expensive exercise we've experienced in decades. We've got a lot of buildings here. This hasn't been done right since 95, 97. Wow. And that was, that wasn't that about the time the first, uh, the building code changed? He said some builder, buildings were beyond repair. I would like to see some buildings demolished, he said. The statewide audit is set to continue until 2023, and every week now high-rise buildings are identified. Victorian Treasurer Tim Pallas said the government had the money to increase the rectification budget if needed. Well, no, the government is taking the money from your citizens. Or maybe all that money you made, maybe all that money the state government took in stamp duty and other fees and charges for these developments should be used to ensure that they're fit for purpose. You know, why not? The people have bought the things paid for it. We do have a, modesty con a modest contingency capacity, Mr. Pallas said. From my perspective, we will do whatever is necessary to perfect protect the welfare of Victorians. Yeah, and, and except, um, except having enough police, huh? You know, there's a whole lot of other issues in Victoria. Wow, I'm, I mean, I grew up in Victoria, guys, in, in you know, Coldstream, out near Yarra Valley. And I'm glad we moved to Queensland and I can bring my family up here. It's a lot warmer too. So what are these materials? What are these materials? And we'll have a look here. We'll just jump to this website. Now, this is a company that I've got nothing to do with. You know, it's not sponsored content. I just picked them from a YouTube search. It's Masterwall. Now, this is an example of how these materials are used. They provide tremendous insulative benefits. Now, notice here how it's a polyurethane phone. That's the big point of difference because you can put it here. You can get really good insulation on your buildings. The last time I used something like this was when I worked as an employee for the government 
like when I first graduated from uni and we were putting it on, on public housing because they can render it and, you know, stuck on the side of a building provides great R value insulation and, you know, it's pretty easy to do. But, here's the but, it's when they this material isn't used, when another material is used because this is polyurethane. Okay, we're not talking about polyurethane, that's the issue. We're talking about polystyrene. Now, you might recognize polystyrene from your next last time you bought a computer screen. You know, styrofoam. It's a really useful material for packing, packing things, sending stuff around, and, and filler of different stuff. Here, this is a good picture as well. And again, I've just found this on the internet. I'm not endorsing this company, I've got nothing to do with them. Um, to be brutally honest, I get Rachel to specify most of our products, at least all the interior stuff. She picks all that, you know, I, I like simple white, black and, and timber natural colors, you know, that the girls pick the, pick the pretty things. So we have here, you know, polyurethane on the right is a polymer composed of organic units joined by uh, urethane links. They were first made by Otto Bayer and his co-workers in the IG Farben and Leverkunz. Germany 1937. It is mostly used in construction, car seating, and furniture, but it's also used in many other applications. So here you can see just the difference. This is a similar product with different types of insulations. The polyurethane here and the polystyrene here. So polystyrene is a, le is a synthetic aromatic polymer made from the monomer styrene, which is also known as styrofoam. It is a white brittle material that is frequently used in shipping to protect goods inside. So you can see the difference here. So uh, just if this is already all installed by the time you get on site, how are you going to be able to tell what the difference is from the outside? You're not. You need to look inside. So you need to trust. You need to trust the documentation and the information that has been provided to you by the builder, and that has been provided to the certifier by the builder. So let's look at the difference between polystyrene and polyurethane. And this is from sciencing.com. And we'll just have a read through this article. Because it's important, because I, I would argue that you know, most of the time, most of the time people are hopefully specifying the correct material, poly polyurethane. I imagine there could be, and I'm not sure, correct me if I'm wrong, if you impregnated the polystyrene perhaps with a chemical, they could make it as a fire retardant, but I'm not sure. You, The problem is you'd spec the more expensive one and people would say, look, I've got this other pro product that's exactly the same and cheaper. Can we use that? You know? Maybe the, the client's talking directly with the builder at the stage. You, you, as the architect, are no longer involved in the construction of the project. You're just providing support, but you're not at supervising it. Or maybe the subby has replaced the products and no one knew. So both polystyrene and polyurethane are polymers, synthetic substances made from long chains of molecules. These molecules consist mostly of carbon and hydrogen atoms. Industry produces these ubiquitous plastic building materials to make all sorts of common items. The computers we use are typically encased in polystyrene with an older polymer, which is an older polymer. However, polyurethane is increasingly coming to replace polystyrene in certain situations, particularly those which require more flexibility. Though there are some, they are sometimes confused, there are differences between the two in terms of their composition, the ability to, of finished product to resist chemicals, conduct heat and the tolerance for thicknesses. Composition. Polystyrene is a polymer containing molecules composed of carbon and hydrogen atoms, typically eat eight of each. The molecular formula polyurethane, on the other hand, describes a much more complex polymer made from molecules composed of nitrogen and oxygen, as well as carbon and hydrogen. Unlike polystyrene, which forms a hard plastic, polyurethane's polymers can be arranged differently to create substances with varying degrees of flexibility. So R values, and this is to do with the insulation. So under the National Construction Code, we need to achieve certain R values and insulation in the walls, ceilings, and floors of buildings. So they're not as cold as my 100-year-old Queenslander is, with single glazing and gaps in the floor where I can see down to the ground. <laughs> Beautiful in summer! If you get the windows open and get a nice breeze through, beautiful. Winter, let's just say uh, I'm, I'm glad of my Germanic heritage and hopefully that's built some resistance to the cold. Although I have moved to Queensland and become a lot softer than when I grew up in Victoria. I tell you that. We don't know what, uh, what cold is in Queensland. 
Well, actually, actually, I, I say that jokingly, but I've had uh, Germans who've moved over here to, from Germany and they were saying they're colder here in Australia than in Germany because they're living in our buildings and they're just not as well insulated as what they used to in Germany. In Germany, you got these beautifully insulated buildings for the winter, you know, without any air gaps, with enough insulation and all heated. Where here you got, you know, protecting Queenslanders, you, you got nothing, guys. Your insulation is a piece of timber like that. You know. Anyway. The R value of building materials measures its thermal resistance. Polyurethane demonstrates about twice the resistance to heat that polystyrene manages and is an excellent material for electrical installation. insulation. In addition, polyurethane continues to maintain flexibility in very cold conditions, though a gradual stiffening begins at zero degrees Fahrenheit. What's this Fahrenheit stuff? However, this resistance varies according to the density and thickness of each material. So say you were, you know, a builder and you replace all of your polyurethane with polystyrene because it was cheaper, but it was the same thickness, so, so no one would tell. You wouldn't achieve the same R values. You wouldn't even just if, regardless of all the fire issues, say that both materials had no fire issues, the polystyrene wouldn't achieve the same effect. So you wouldn't be meeting the same performance requirements. So let's keep going. And hang on. Fire resistance. Here's the issue. Polyurethane does not melt, unlike polystyrene. In fact, polyurethane will remain mostly undamaged by heat until temperatures reaching 700 degrees, at which point the material begins to char. So it chars. So it's similar to, to you know, a big hunk of timber, 700 degrees. So putting it on a building will be less of a risk than polystyrene. So polystyrene will melt the temperatures in 100 to 300 degree range polyurethane makes a superior fire retardant material. So you can see the difference between the two materials. Chemical resistance weathering and abrasion. While polystyrene will suffer when subjected to solvents such as gasoline and certain insect sprays, polyurethane is resistant to all chemicals. Of course, don't, didn't people like make homemade napalm out of this stuff by pouring gasoline on it? This pollen, so what if you, what if you, you know, you pour thingamajig here, you know, Finch or Craig, what's his name? Craig, Craig Finch, Fitch, Craig Fitch, and someone pours gasoline on here and it gets through, your, your wall's going to dissolve. Load bearing. Since polyurethane res resembles rubber as well as plastic, it can be effectively used to make load bearing wheels, mechanical joints, couplings, and machine mounts. Polystyrene does not have the flexibility for these tasks. Noise abatement. Since it, has, since it has similar qualities of rubber, polyurethane is useful in achieving maximum sound reduction. Gears made from this polymer make much less noise. So that gives us a bit of an understanding of the differences between the two materials. So we can clearly see why polystyrene is not a useful material in applications like this. I mean, that's right. If they had to move the wood chips, if someone chucked a cigarette in there, it caught on fire, some of the wood chips, and then this stuff all burned. Because this is a footpath. People could walk past here. So that's why it's a risk. That's why it's a risk. They need to put no smoking signs on here or danger flammable cladding on signs on here. Wow. So guys, I thought I'd, I'd share this with you just to you know enlighten you all a bit more about the differences in the two materials. I think it's very important. I'd be interested to see some drawings of this to see what was actually specified. My instincts tells me it was probably a last minute substitution, either sub subby or builder, someone cutting corners. The fact that the builder was deregistered would, you know, has since been deregistered, tells me that maybe he's not the best builder. Maybe he's not the best builder. And that's the problem. Stuff like this is coming in. Stuff like this is being used illegally, you know, and it's not being caught. It's not being caught. I want to know how this building was procured. What method? Was it design and construct? Was the builder the developer? How did how was it built? What were the legal ramifications? Whose job was it to supervise the construction? Anyway, guys, thank you for joining me for this episode. Please like, share, and subscribe. Ding the bell to see my daily videos, or well, twice daily at the moment, and I'll see you all later. Have a nice day.